so uh, I was a little desperate to make a video, so I decided to make something that, uh, because I got, I watched something and it just made me mad. So I watched a video recently called Which Spider-Man Movie is the Best? And you know, I don't usually watch these kind of videos made by these corporation type company channels. I, I like it's from a channel called Insider. I don't like I don't like these people. Just just to shout out some shitheads out there. Uh, Screen Rant. I'm talking about Looper. I'm talking about the richest. They can kindly fuck off. I don't understand how people e are even appealed to these things. Who is the target audience? They have such generic thumbnails and titles. Who watches this stuff? This is the same people that watch BuzzFeed stuff. Anyways, back to the topic on hand. Basically, the video sucks ass because it hardly has an opinion. It plays it very safe if it doesn't feel like a person is actually voicing their opinion. It feels like they just collected stuff that they've researched from different people and put it into a script it it, it just doesn't feel authentic and uh here's the real kicker at the end of the video they don't tell you which movie they think is the best they say who is the best portrayal of spider-man which is quite misleading uh hey youtube uh these people broke the guidelines of misleading with the title so uh, can we get a strike on them please so i decided as the greatest youtuber on earth i'm going to make my own list and uh i'm going to use the same formula thing that they used in their video just to make it easy and also because i'm lazy and i ain't gonna hold back on my opinions either because i ain't a, a little pussy bitch so to start off this thing we're going to be talking about the actors so of course we have to talk about toby Maguire first Listen, I have a really soft spot for the original trilogy because this is the movie that defined me as a person. Spider-Man 1 was the first exposure to a uh, Spider-Man that I've ever had in my life, basically. And it changed me. So, of course, beware that I'm going to be a little, a little biased, but I'm going to try to be unbiased as well. So, uh, Tobey Maguire, as an actor, I wouldn't call him, like... A, a, a grade A actor. I mean, he's okay. He, <laughs> but I will say he does play uh, the nerdy Peter Parker very well. He definitely embodies who Peter Parker is—a a shy and quiet guy. But once under the mask, he's a bit more outgoing. His portrayal is definitely more of a uh, the '60s and '70s version of Spider-Man. So, so uh, you know, you can't beat the classics. And despite what everyone says, I think he does a, a good job at what he was supposed to do and it's iconic role and he's the first live action spider-man in a movie to play him so if everybody's going to compare to him as much as i love these movies i won't say he is the definitive actor of spider-man there's, there's people i always see this everywhere like people are like oh he'll always be spider-man to me nobody can ever beat him but it's, it's just that's just nostalgia talking and it's just Anyways, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. Let's continue. Next up, we're going to be talking about Andrew Garfield. Now, I think he is probably the best actor to play Spider-Man, but I don't think his portrayal of Spider-Man was the best. In fact, I think he is the worst portrayal of Spider-Man in a movie so far. They just, they try to mess around too much in the first movie. They're like, oh, we got to be super different from the first one because people always compare to that but then at the same time they're doing like the same story as them and it's just so conflicting everything comes out bleh. and that's definitely the case for peter parker in the amazing spider-man movies so uh <laughs> they try to make him too cool for school and that's a big no-no because he's supposed to be the underdog he's supposed to be a, a sort of a relatable character but he's just obnoxious sometimes and he's i don't know it's just not good and uh, in the amazing spider-man 2 they try to differentiate itself from the previous movie again because oh people didn't like that one that much let's make it more light let's put a put, bunch put of stuff in it and like it's just no it's poor andrew garfield at least all the 
actors from those movies moved on to do bigger and better things. Up next, Tom Holland. He He's definitely the, I would say, the best portrayal of a live-action Spider-Man because he, he embodies both Peter Parker and Spider-Man very well because people would always say like, oh, Tobey Maguire was the best Peter Parker and Andrew Garfield was the best Spider-Man. But this, this is a very good combination of both. He's also the first Spider-Man actor to be younger than me, which feels weird. I mean, he's not that much younger than me, but still, still, it's just weird to think about. And Tom Holland, you know, he's got some great acting jobs and I, I know he's still sort of like new to the Hollywood thing and I haven't really, haven't seen any other movies that he's been in, but I've heard he's been good in those other movies, so, yeah. Alright, up next we got, uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. We're gonna be talking about Miles Morales, who was played by, hold on just a second, uh, the Shamik Moore, that's who he is, yeah. I've never really seen any other movies that this guy's been in, either. And it's also a voice portrayal, which is different from what the other actors have done. But he he definitely does a very good job as Miles Morales. He sounded like, you know, a kid and he <laughs> who was going through a bunch of stuff. So, uh, yeah, B good job, Shamik. Good job. I don't I don't know what else to say about this one. OK, it's it's different. OK, next up, the stories. So in Spider-Man 1, it is an introduction to Peter Parker and his origin as Spider-Man and he's learning with great power comes great responsibility and he has to face the Green Goblin and save Mary Jane and you know what more could you want really in a Spider-Man story the movie definitely takes more of a cheesy side to it which is it's fine che like people always complain about oh the, the, the original the Sam Raimi trilogy was a very cheesy but like Come on, just because it's cheesy doesn't mean it's bad. As long as it's handled well, and I know Sam Raimi really handles like campiness and like serious stuff very well, despite it being like very delicate. Listen, the story ain't bad, okay? Th this movie defined the superhero genre. Listen, okay? It's a good story, teaches good things. I'm gonna be a little biased again. This is personally my favorite movie of all time. However, now, just because something is my favorite movie doesn't mean it's the best movie ever made. Get what I'm saying here? You, you get it? This movie just means so much to me. That's that's why it's my favorite. But I won't. I but I will admit it is not the best Spider-Man movie. Spider-Man Two. It 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 delves a little deeper into the character of Peter Parker and more about responsibility you just see him get beat down so much and you, he just he's basically just beaten to the ground by so much shit and like mary jane uh, and then and, and doc ock and, and harry osborne and just uh, there's a reason why people say this is one of the best sequels ever made because it is it does so much more than spider-man one it, it improves stuff and it builds on stuff. It builds character and it has another great villain. Oh, I didn't talk about William Def William Defoe in Spider-Man. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's backpedal for a second. This this is such an unorganized mess, but fuck it. It's still better than whatever Insider made. So anyways, William Defoe, man, he played the shit out of Green Goblin. The Green Goblin is Spider-Man's arch nemesis, no doubt. I mean, he he's done the most, just the most bad stuff to Spider-Man, okay? And it, it's so iconic. And now back to Spider-Man 2. Uh, Doc Ock, played by Alfred Molina, he's very, a very sympathetic character, I think, that you don't get from the comic books. In the comics, he's he's definitely a, a one of the best Spider-Man villains out there. Some would even argue that he is the arch nemesis of Spider-Man. The movie makes him a lot more sympathetic, I think. And that's the things that Spider-Man movies do. They definitely flesh out the characters a bit more than the comic books, which is weird because it's usually the sometimes the other way around. Yeah, that, that's what they did, and they did, did a good job with him. And also, like, the action in Spider-Man 2, like the train scene. Don't even get me started on a train scene. That is 
I still to this day think that is the best Spider-Man action scene or even one of the best superhero action scenes ever. I mean, he's on top of the train, then they're on the side of the train, he's in the train, and he's got to get out of the train, and, and he's got to stop it with all of his strength, and, oh, and, then, and then the people carrying him, and they're like, oh, thank you, Spider-Man. We won't tell anybody about your secret identity. He's like, cool, fam, pound it. And oh, it's so great. It's so good. And then and, and the movie sets up Harry Osborn in, as the uh, new Green Goblin, which brings us to Spider-Man 3. <sighs> uh, man, it, it's, a, it's a mess. I won't, it's not the worst Spider-Man movie, I don't think. There are definitely good moments in it. I think, like, Sandman was an unnecessary villain in this movie, but I think they also fleshed him out a bit more in that, in the scene where he becomes the Sandman, I think is just, it's just really good with the, with the score and like just the emotion that you feel out of it. It's, it's really good, but the movie should have definitely focused more on Harry Osborn as the villain, I think. I mean, I know it would have been like oh, the second movie it, to have a, a Green Goblin, but like they've been building on this. Here's what happened, okay? Sony got their grubby hands into the Spider-Man movies for like the first time, really. And this is where they started showing that Sony was is not a very good movie production. Whenever the corporate side of it gets into the shit, it gets really bad, as we can see from Spider-Man 3 all the way to The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Sam Raimi didn't even want Venom to be in this movie. He didn't know too much about Venom, so he didn't even want to touch the, the whole black suit stuff. But fucking Avi Rod, the producer of like every superhero movie, he's like, no man, you gotta, you gotta put them in and you sell them. So oh, it makes a bunch of money when you sell the action figures and just a bunch of shit. Just fuck shit. And they also mess with Peter Parker, they make him an asshole, and they also make Mary Jane sort of like, everything's about me. And <laughs> and Venom, ugh, Eddie Brock was such a big miscast with uh, <laughs> Eric Foreman. Uh, it's, eh. So after the failure of Spider-Man 3 and the uh, lack of production on Spider-Man 4, they made The Amazing Spider-Man because Sony wanted to keep the rights to Spider-Man and Listen, these two movies are so weird to think about because they're so insignificant. They added absolutely nothing. All people remember now is the Spider-Man trilogy and the new MCU Spider-Man. <laughs> Poor old Amazing Spider-Man, but nobody ever thinks about it. The Amazing Spider-Man 1 rehashes like the origin story, but they make it darker. Like... <laughs> It's so stupid. Like, you can have a dark Spider-Man movie. There, ha There is a moments where his, his stories have been really dark. But this is not the way you should do it. The costume sucks. The, the, the villain sucks. And it's so weird because Mark Webb, he's not a bad director. It's... I don't think it's his fault. I guess the best thing they really did for The Amazing Spider-Man is that they showed Spider-Man as more of a scientist and a nerd. So that that's kind of cool, I guess. Uh, I guess no, actually, there there is one scene that I really like in that movie, and that's when the cars are like dangling from the from the bridge, and he's like webbed them all up, and there's a kid trapped in a car, and he goes down there, and he, it feels really like it was such a Spider-Man moment because he he takes off the mask, he's like, listen, dude, I'm like I'm gonna get you out of here, and put the mask on, it'll make you stronger. It's 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 just really good, okay? It, that, that's like that that is a really good moment but that's still that's like the only one that's like the only one in the whole movie and i, I will say though that uh gwen stacy is a better probably a better flesh out love interest than mary jane was i mean in the comics i prefer mary jane over gwen stacy but in these movies gwen stacy's definitely better and she's played by emma stone and ooh, ooh, emma stone just listen emma stone if for some reason you're watching this please let me take you out to a lovely lobster dinner so uh, the villain was uh, the lizard in this movie, and this is just the most boring, the most nothing thing that they could have done. Dr. Connors was also in the first original trilogy of Spider-Man, and he might have gotten his own uh, 
time to shine in a different movie but this one I don't, they just didn't do much with him he's just like a sign he's just a scientist missing an arm and he just wants to grow it back you don't tell why it's so important for this to happen I mean, in the comics, it's because I think he lost it in a war. He also has a family which they didn't touch upon in the movie. Like, there's a deleted scene where he's talking to his son, and that adds something. But because it's out of the movie, it, it's still nothing with him. And his whole plan to make the <laughs> to make make the whole city into lizard people, like what the fuck? And we've seen that the, the thing only lasts for like a couple hours. So unless he perfected it, but they never said it. Everyone would have just been lizards for like two to three hours and then just went back to their normal lives. It's so stupid. I, and then we get to The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which is a bigger, more jumbled mess than Spider-Man 3. It has the same amount of villains, but it has a lot more stuff they're trying to shove in. They got Aunt May doing nursing stuff. They got Spider-Man and Gwen Stacy and their on and off relationship. And they got Electro and they got Harry Osborn and they got Oscorp making the Sinister Six for some reason. And they got, and they still got like Spider-Man's parents backstory, which nobody cared about. The movies try to like reveal some secret stuff about Spider-Man, but all this movie does is make Spider-Man feel like he was the chosen one or something. But the whole thing about Spider-Man is that he was just a kid randomly getting these powers and he has to learn how to do all this stuff and learn about responsibility but these movies make it sound like oh he was destined to be spider-man and oh oscorp has to make these villains to kill him for some fucking reason electro is goofy but not the funny goofy like the green goblin was it like people compared him to the riddler and Batman Forever. That's a pretty good comparison since he's just an over obsessed villain that becomes stupid. <laughs> the Rhino was ah oh, that that made me so fucking mad. And listen, at the time, I liked this movie. I'm I hate to admit this, but I liked this movie when it came out. But even then, I hated the Rhino part because it was such nothing, and, and they wasted such a good actor. And it's so fucking over the top. I hated it. I hated it so fucking much. And also, what they did to Harry Osborn, he, he is probably the most, dis, just, just the worst looking Green Goblin we've seen on screen. I think there is a good way to portray a comic book Green Goblin. And uh, I think it's uh, this image right here. I think that could work in live action. But people are so fucking scared to do it to embrace the comic bookiness even though spider-man's costume and like his attitude is like super comic booky looking they don't they don't do anything with the green goblin it's it's so he just looks like a, a tumor in a in a robot suit and i hate it they wasted such a good character norman osborne is better than harry osborne i don't know why they switched it up and made him kill, kill gwen stacy but Whatever. Okay, let's move on to bigger and better things. Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, this is definitely not my favorite Spider-Man movie. However, I will. It's it's a good movie. There, there's another video talking about how Spider-Man Homecoming is not a good Spider-Man movie. It's a good movie, but not a good Spider-Man movie. Like it doesn't have the same feel. You, like, you know what I mean? It's by High Top Films. I really recommend if you check it out. He'll probably explain it way better than I can because he actually wrote a script and I'm just kind of saying stuff off the top of my head because I was not prepared to make this this video. I think this movie relies too much on Spider-Man being in the MCU and on relying on Tony Stark and his super suit. Where's my super suit? The movie and the marketing definitely throws in your face that, oh, he's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You're welcome, Spider-Man fans. He's finally here. And it's it's just really obnoxious to the point where it doesn't feel like a very good standalone Spider-Man movie. It relies way too much on what has happened previously and too, it too much on Iron Man. You can have Iron Man in this movie, that's fine. But I think it, he just relies way too much on trying to impress Tony Stark and like relying on the like the, the suit that can do almost everything. I think because Spider-Man, he's supposed to handle his stuff on his own. It, it makes him feel like he can't do things on his own unless he has help from until until the end of the movie which gets really really good when he has to wear his old suit and take down the vulture and he and he, like he's got this rubble on his back this iconic moment from the comic books when he has to lift all this rubble off of his back that's like 
way more than he thought he could lift. But he he realizes that he has to pick it up and and do the best that he can. In the comic books, he was like he was trying to find a cure for like Aunt May's sickness, and he was like in an underwater base where Doc Ock was. The building is collapsing, and like there's water coming in from the ocean, and like he's he'll die and let Aunt May die if he doesn't get out of it. So with all his strength and all his will, he picks it up. And this is the same moment. It's so good. It's really good. And also the Vulture is like probably one of the best MCU villains because they've been lacking in good villains. But this one, in a really long time, this is like the first like really good villain. And also the first good villain in a Spider-Man movie in a really long time. So that's, that's great. Played by Michael Keaton. And people say like he should have played they should have reserved him to play the green goblin I, I mean i don't care either way he did a good job and yeah i probably batted on this movie a little too much it's sort of conflicting but i definitely like it more than i don't like it you know what i mean you know what i mean yeah i also like it's kind of weird like i like the character dead leads but he's just miles morales's character genki but, but he's just peter parker's friend with a different name from it's just i mean like it works i like him but it's it's just kind of weird that they would do that and also mary jane listen i hate to go on another big tangent here but so far what i've seen of the mary jane of the mj character i don't like it she's just a weird socially awkward person that draws people when they're sad and it's funny goofy random and which is not which is not mary jane i know she's not mary jane technically but they can't now they can't introduce mary jane because she's mj and that would be too weird if there's another character named mary jane came in so thanks a lot okay now let's talk about spider-man into the spider-verse now this is an animated movie and it's probably good that it is because you can do a lot more with an animated movie than you could with live action i want to talk about stuff but we're still on the story side so i can't touch on it yet but anyways this time it's about miles morales a different spider-man about a fresh a fresh take on the spider-man story sort of miles morales gets these spider powers and and he's taught by a different spider-man the original spider-man which is and there's like it's a nice homage to the original trilogy, but it's definitely not this, like, in, back on the Insider video, they said, oh, this is definitely the uh, Sam Raimi trilogy Spider-Man. But in the beginning of the uh, the movie, there's a giant green goblin running around. So it's definitely not, you fucking dumbass. It's just a nice homage for fans of the original trilogy, okay? So in this movie, he has to help stop this, uh, multi-dimensional collider that kingpin is trying to do for his little thing and all these spider-man come together including a peter parker spider-man that's older uh gwen stacy penny uh penny parker noir spider-man and uh spider-ham and all these different spider-man have to work together and miles morales has to learn to become spider-man and the, the whole core of this movie is that anyone can be spider-man you can wear the mask we're all Spider-Man, and ugh, there's nothing really captures that moment more than the tribute scene with Stan Lee when Miles Morales is buying a, co a costume in his store to like pay respects to Spider-Man. He's like, "Can I return the suit if it doesn't fit?" And Stan Lee goes, "It'll it always fits eventually," and that just that just warms my heart, dude. Oh, and you know, as cheesy as this message is, like, "Oh, you can you can do you can change the world and whatever." It it's a really inspirational one, and it does a very good job at telling it. The main focus of these movies is mostly Miles Morales, Peter Parker, and Gwen Stacy. The other three, Spider-Man, they're there for like for funds and funsies and uh, fan service, and that's uh, that's fine. I understand that you can't focus on every Spider-Man woman. I think it does a really good job at showing that Miles Morales needs to trust himself and uh, do the best that he can, and that Peter Parker. Peter B. Parker, ugh, sorry, needs to get back up and try his best again to get with Mary Jane. And Gwen Stacy needs to trust 
people again and be, and be friends with people. The Kingpin is all... I really like the cartoony, biggish look that car, uh, Kingpin has. He does have a threatening presence, even though I never considered him to be that threatening at all because he's just a guy who's really s strong. Because if you don't know, he's... He looks fat, but he's not fat. That's just muscle. He, like, he's got like 2% fat in him, but he's trained his body to be just a big mass of muscle. But still, I don't think that's enough to stop Spider-Man, so I don't, I never really got how that would be much of a fight between Spider-Man and Kingpin. But there are definitely other villains in here. There's a, a really surprise one that if you haven't seen the movie, I'm not going to spoil it, but let's just... Let's just say it was a very nice surprise that I didn't see coming. And also the Prowler, I never really thought of him as much of a character in the comics, but they definitely do a really good job. And he's definitely important to Miles Morales' story, and I think they did a really good job of making him, like, threatening and cool. So then, yeah. Yeah, this, this, this movie has a really unique story that's different from the others, and I like its... its, uh, its riskiness. Oh, shit. Right, okay, so the next topic was actually the villains. But I've pretty much already talked about them. So, I guess we can skip that one. This one I don't think should count that much. But the next topic is faithfulness to comics. I mean, it's nice to have a bit of faithfulness. But I don't think you should copy one-to-one -one because comic books don't always translate that well to movies. But uh, anyways, to Spider-Man 1, he, I said this before. It's definitely has that 60s, 70s spider-man comic feel and i think it works very well that's why it's so cheesy and fun and lighthearted. but it definitely does have its like grimy and uh emotional parts to it that i think work really well much like the comic books back then in like 2002 or earlier you wouldn't really think that spider-man's costume would translate that well to live action but it, it really does and even though this isn't the most uh comic book accurate costume i think it works really well j jonah jameson is just oh, it's it's per he's perfect he's perfect jk simmons he's he's he does the bet he's the best he's and listen i don't know how they're gonna ever implement another j jonah jameson to the thing but i mean because people are going to compare him to jk simmons but i think if the new Spider-Man movies, like Spider-Man Far From Home, I don't think they'd ever, I don't think they're going to introduce him in that movie, but if they ever introduce him into the MCU, I think Brian Cranston would make a very good J. Jonah Jameson. He can be angry and he can be comedic and I think, and he's an angry old man, so I think it could work. But anyways, uh, the the Green Goblin's costume, I mean, people say, oh, it, it, bleh, it doesn't look that good and it's got a little motorcycle helmet. <laughs> I mean, I get why they kind of did that. I mean, it's, it, would, it would be hard to translate his uh, comic book look to live action. But like I said, I think there is a way to implement his look to, to live action. I think everyone like was pretty comic book accurate with all the characters and stuff. I mean, Mary Jane was, she she didn't, she felt like she really always needed, and like, in the comic book, she did occasionally have to be saved by Spider-Man, but she would always put up a fight and, like, have faith in Peter and stuff like that. And, like, she she was her own character, and she was a strong supporting character to Spider-Man, but she wasn't really that much in these movies. Uh, in Spider-Man 2, uh, I mean, yeah, Doc Ock doesn't have his, like, <laughs> green suit which is fine i will give him th that that the trench coat and the glasses are fine by me i don't care too much i also think they did a really good job with the arms translating them into the real world and stuff and the whole spider-man no more storyline it's different and it's kind of weird that he just loses his powers i think they could have done a different way of showing that i don't want to be spider-man anymore other than just losing his powers but i will say that the scene where he has to save a kid in a burning building without his powers was really strong but then he realizes that there's another person that died in that building and if he had those powers he could have saved them and that just that just crushes him and i think that's a really good scene and that's like the only defense i can have for him not having his powers there but i think they did the storyline really well and when he comes back it just feels really good and in spider-man 3 i mean venom was he's not that menacing looking I don't think I mean yeah he would be scary if you just saw him in a bag alley but like 
He's not Venom though, you know what I mean? The whole black suit story. I mean, I understand why they had to do it differently, uh, but it's just a bit too convenient and a bit too fast, I think, to go through that story. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot because they mentioned it in the in the video. Spider Man doesn't have his web shooters, which that's fine, I guess. I'm uh, I'm either way. Either I mean I would I would like to see web shooters and him do like do different stuff in gadgets and oh no like they crush my web shooters what am I gonna do that, that those situations can be very interesting but I think the natural web shooters in here can also do a bit more like him exploring his powers like in in the first movie when he's in the cafeteria and he accidentally shoots a web and stuff that's pretty fun I guess I'm a little more excited on the web shooter stuff because it does definitely show uh, Peter's more scientific side. And it, it definitely brings up different situational stuff. And he can do different things with his webs too. Also, another thing that they get right in these movies is that Peter Parker is always late uh, with like attending stuff. And he has to sacrifice being with, uh, being with the people he loves to be Spider-Man so that he can save other people. So that there's not another Uncle Ben situation. On to the Amazing Spider-Man movies. The web shooters are comic book accurate. Um, I think the Gwen Stacy stuff is actually she it's not that accurate really she wasn't they didn't meet in high school and she wasn't like a scientist she she was that she was just like a, a pretty girl that Peter was interested in and was in in college I think they did more with Gwen Stacy in the movies than they did in the comic books I mean the Uncle Ben's death thing is faithful uh, yeah but <laughs> of course it has to be the, the costume in the second movie I will say it's very accurate. I'm not a huge fan of the big eyes though. I know a lot of people like the big eyes on Spider-Man, but I, I don't know. It's, it's a bit too much. I like a medium sized one, you know? Like uh, like in Homecoming. Speaking of Homecoming, let's talk about that movie. I think this, it's my favorite suit out of all the live action Spider-Man movies because it's the, it's the most comic book looking one, but it's not ridiculous looking. And I, I know that like the black lines around like his arms and stuff is like, it's different, but it doesn't really take away that like like the eyes, like the face. When you see the mask, it looks like the classic Steve Ditko drawings of Spider-Man in the comics, and I th I just like that classic feel of Spider-Man. I also think they got down his uh, nerdy stuff down really well. Liz Allen, like he was hey, he had a crush on Liz Allen, like in the comics, but it really led to nowhere, <laughs> like in the movies. The Vulture, he is different. But I think it's a good different from the comic books. You, this is one costume you cannot portray in the movies because it's too ridiculous. It's just an old man in a green feathery costume. It's, it's not good. And he's also he was never that compelling of a character either. So when I heard the vulture was in this movie, I was like, oh no. But in the, but once I saw the movie, I was like, oh yes. He also had help making it, uh, getting the suit made by the Tinkerer. Which, which is another character in the comics and they don't explicitly say he's the tinkerer it's it's fine it's whatever and the dynamic between peter and tony it's it's pretty good even though i still prefer spider-man doing his own thing it's still cool to see them interact together in the comic books especially in the civil war storyline it's pretty interesting and now spider-man into the spider-verse this this is definitely the most comic booky movie to ever exist thanks to it being animated and it has such a cool style it's just it really does feel like a comic book come to life if you pause at any moment it'll look like a, a really stylized comic book and it's just so cool to look at it's a combination of 2d and 3d actually and it took them a year to get this uh whole formula perfected so that's really cool and i love that dedication of course they have to make miles Morales' story a little different because in the comics other spider people didn't pop up in his origin he just had to basically learn stuff by himself after Peter Parker in his universe died, but I think the character is actually a lot more fleshed out than he than he is in the comic books, which is a good thing because people have complained that he's not that interesting of a character. He he's just he's just Peter Parker with the, that's it. Like there's no point in having a new Spider-Man if he's just the same thing. The Spider-Verse story, uh, it of course that's also different as well. It's not as huge a scale. And like the the villains that were in those in the comic book story, it's it's not the same thing. Of course, they have to make it like dumbed down for this movie because it just would have been 
way too much and like maybe a sequel maybe a sequel can pull this off it sticks to the comics very well i don't know uh, what else do you want me to say okay so the final verdict i mean it, it's spider-man into the spider-verse is the it's the best spider-man movie i think it, it's close close up is spider-man 2 then spider-man 1 then homecoming then uh, Spider-Man 3 tied with Amazing Spider-Man 1 and uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2. That's the list. That's my list anyways. I know there's people out there who's like, Homecoming's my favorite. And I, I mean, if you, that's fine, I guess. But I'm just like, what the, what the fuck? But yeah, that's, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I've, this is, this recording's been going on for almost an hour. So... I've been, I've been sitting here for like an hour talking about Spider-Man stuff. That's cool. Well, um, except for the part where I'm talking to myself the whole time. Yeah, that's the video. Hope you enjoyed my <laughs> mind better than whatever Insider made. I I, pre I really do appreciate you guys watching my videos. And, and uh, for all those people who subscribe to me, sticking around and watching my stuff, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I feel weird doing this every time, but please remember to like and subscribe. Maybe share it with your friends because I really want the recognition. Well, thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys later. Bye.